So I'm going to invite um, from the CMU, Pakistan CMU, um, to start our first session um, on our country presentations. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the organizers to give me this opportunity to present on behalf of the Common Management Unit uh, for AIDS, TB, and malaria, uh, working under the Ministry of Health in Pakistan. So basically, uh, I will be very short uh, in time, but uh, what I want to focus is would be an experience uh, that culminate into a success story in Pakistan regarding the implementation of DHIS-2, especially the case-based DHIS-2 in Pakistan. Uh, and perhaps it would be beneficial to those countries who are now planning to embark on the case-based DHIS-2. So, basically, this is the overall uh, geographical and technical spread of the DHIS-2 case-based for three diseases uh, in Pakistan. Uh, let me uh, apprise you that basically we started the DHIS-2 aggregate model in the year 2018, in the late 2018, and uh, speedily we take up the three programs engaged within the, the DHIS-2 dashboards. And as if you see here, we have at, uh, right from the beginning, we engaged the public as well as the private sector in Pakistan working for TB AIDS and malaria. So here you can just have, just to show you that uh, if we say about the TB, we have more, at the moment more than 1,700 facilities who are on the aggregate model in, in Pakistan, coupled with more than 12,000 general practitioners who are working in the private sector. Similarly, for HIV AIDS, we have 75 ART centers, along with the 60 community-based organization working for HIV AIDS. And likewise, in malaria, if you see, there are over 4,000 facilities who are reporting on the aggregate model in the, in the country. So these are perhaps, this is the last day and you will be quite fed up of seeing lot many dashboards and this is one of them. Uh, uh, this dashboard is showing that we have been uh, reporting the data from the district, province and at the national level on, the, on these dashboards which I show for the TB, HIV and malaria. And uh, Regarding that, all the other uh, uh, things which we which are have the provisions to to show us through the DHIS2 dashboard, we have availed all those provisions uh, on these dashboards, like these heat maps or uh, and the updating of the population every year on these dashboards. But th the story doesn't end here as these are the aggregate model dashboards. What we actually, uh, I'm going to tell you in the next slide is about the case-based uh, updates. So for the case-based, we had, what we had to uh, actually accomplish for was the hardware capacity, the software capacity, data quality elements, the data entry protocols, uh, SOPs regarding especially uh, unique identifier coding system for the data confidentiality, data storage, data access, as well as the countrywide capacity building of the people entering the data into the DHIS-2. So as you know that we are uh, more than, at the moment, uh, 225 million population and a huge infrastructure across the country for three diseases, you can imagine it, was, it must be a challenging task for the Pakistan. But let me remind you here that uh, with the support of all stakeholders within the country, all public-private stakeholders, 
and especially the international stakeholders working with us, they were the, uh, the actual uh, actors behind this success story. So you can see here the international stakeholders who were there, right from the USAID's support through TIFA and JSI, WHO technical support, uh, multi-country grant, UNDP support, HISP and UIO, of course, KIT, the Royal Institute of Tropical Institute of Netherlands, Global Fund, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So all were there for the this development of the case-based dashboard for the TB. Uh, so these are the milestones achieved. We, as I told you, we started our journey for the aggregate model in 2018. But what happened afterwards, uh, let me tell you that uh, to prepare the country for the case-based is a really a challenging task. And uh, one should not undermine the, the, those challenging tasks. Uh, because the case-based is a sort of maybe one, uh, one day process to be started on, but the preparation take, take us almost two years to complete it. And what we did, we did uh, the, uh, this uh, software upgradation, hardware upgradation. We do have the uh, dedicated server for that, but it didn't have the capacity at that moment to, to absorb the case-based data. Uh, the SOP is very important, uh, which, which we always mention that how we will be have this uh, sort of uh, confidentiality, access, sharing, lot many things to be done and we did the, all those things with the help of everyone on board. Uh, then we have the uninterrupted supply through the solar system. There, are, there was a huge procurement process involved for the case based. We have to buy uh, laptops for all the 1400 facilities in Pakistan and we provided laptops to them. We provided internet connectivity support to every facility to enter data. We provided uh, the, the trainings to them. And uh, then we piloted the case base in November 2021. Uh, but that pilot was also evaluated with lot many strengths as well as lot many weaknesses. So we tried to overcome all those weaknesses which are present in the system. We have to customize our TB tracker First, we customized the TV tracker according to the Pakistan needs, but afterwards, uh, we uh, got the technical support from the WHO, and they asked us to customize it according to their demand. So now it is called the WHO TV tracker, of course, with the help of the HISP Pakistan. Then we uh, 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 sort of uh, hired uh, because once we were embarking on the case base, we have to have all continuity of the troubleshooting technical expert right from the national level to the facility level. So we have to hire the provincial level people uh, for the DHS to case based and for the, at the district level, at the divisional level. So it is a huge hiring involved during that process. Then we have to have the reporting formats uh, developed uh, that is the TV notification, uh, TB07 form, as, and the treatment outcome, that is the TB09. And we, it, it took a long time to develop them. We tested the, those, all those forms on the, on the pilot. Then uh, there was a technical working group formed for the DHS2 case space. Uh, so all the procurement, distribution, and availability of the logistics m was made in place. Uh, so finally, there was, a, there was a challenge to actually integrate existing applications which were running uh, in Pakistan, in private sector, as well as in the public sector, like the gene expert, gene expert alert application, the active case founding application, uh, and, and of course, the DRTB application and the LMIS applications. So a lot many applications were there separately, but we have to integrate uh, all those applications on that case-based DHS2 dashboard. 
and of course there were two unique applications which were running in pakistan one was for the multi country grant that is for the cross border uh, uh, people who uh, who are bordering pakistan is bordering to iran and afghanistan and people have to this due to that frequent movement from uh, iran and afghanistan and there are some tb cases there in the in in those uh, communities so we have to take care of all those people who are who may be referred or diagnosed a tb patient through the multi country grant that is mcg and that is run by the undp afghanistan at the moment and there was another application that was called mandatory case notification uh, intervention that is for the private in in private sector any tb patient is diagnosed or referred for screening he must be entered into the dhs2 system so you can understand there were a huge sort of integration involved in, into the case based dhs2 at that time but we did it and uh, we have trained all the facilities uh, in pakistan who are the tb care facilities we have provided all the hardware and software things to them now uh, in twin, in the quarter in this quarter in the current quarter which we are standing in now we the country is actually reporting the case based data for tb uh, at the moment so and there is some uh, line listing available offline data entry mode we managed to do that this is the data tb data entry form of the case based at the moment for for the case notification and apart from this uh, Pakistan is one of the pilot countries among six countries who are selected from the WHO Global TB program for the uh, this PPM dashboard and we have also developed this PPM dashboard with the support of Mercy Corps and his Pakistan of course as well as back end the WHO was supporting us uh, for this and this is a glimpse of that this is a some pictorial glimpse and thanks thank you very much Okay, so we have time for a couple of questions. Are there any questions for Dr. Basharat? Okay. Looks like there's no questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again, sir. Thank you. So I'd like to invite my colleagues from Egypt um, to please give us the next presentation. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you, Sri Lanka, for uh, hosting us and uh, for this uh, beautiful time we are spending and a lot of learning. So I'll be presenting for Egypt. My name is Mata Saleh. Um, I just uh, would like to highlight the importance and essence of scribing and database keeping in Egypt from the very beginning. So this is the Egyptian scribe. He's an integral part of uh, our culture and how the Egyptian civilization has uh, risen at the f from a very early stages, from scribing and uh, making sure that everything is documented. So uh, this is my inter DHIS for us is only started this year. So uh, April 2023, we got introduced to the uh, DHIS. Uh, we, uh, I represent UNICEF, so we took a scoping mission from the Ministry of Health, uh, 10 people, we went to uh, Jordan and we uh, attended the, uh, the academy, the first academy in Arabic. And that was a really excellent uh, starting point for us, uh, for the ministry to understand uh, what does the HIS have to offer, uh, how uh, it can be implemented uh, in an easy, fast manner. Uh, after that, uh, a group from uh, University of Oslo were in uh, Egypt for the WHO, so another meeting with uh, high management in the ministry um, uh, gave them the good opportunity to understand further, and currently we are uh, finalizing our agreement with Oslo and uh, HISPMENA. Uh, so uh, that was May, and then uh, we had a... Uh, several uh, problems. So we have a, uh, 
Okay, so we have two emergencies on our borders. Uh, May, uh, conflict happened in Sudan, and currently we have the conflict uh, in Gaza and, uh, and the war on Gaza, and they were opportunities or a pressing need was presented to us. And actually, uh, Abdurrahman from Amina, he was then with Oslo, he gave us very, very good support uh, for, to develop a tracker uh, for the nutritional status of the Sudanese people, the children coming in uh, as units of that is very important for us. Uh, that the tracker was built in two months when there was no server, not, there was nothing ready yet uh, to roll out and implement the HIS. But we, we needed a mobile, agile system that worked on the borders through mobile apps. So we did the training for frontline personnel, uh, both technical and on the system. And it's up and running. We have over 3,000 cases right now were registered, uh, deployed in um, August, beginning of August. Uh, and then when the uh, crisis in Gaza started, we also needed something for the uh, evacs, the medical evacs, uh, who were being uh, moved into hospitals in Egypt. And this time around, uh, with the support of Hanin Niani, we had the system up and running for a hospital, just a, a tracker of who is coming in, what is the case, what are the, uh, the investigations needed, was ready in three weeks. And we are currently deployed in uh, 20 hospitals across Egypt. So uh, it's very malleable. It's, uh, so this is the uh, Sudan dashboard uh, with uh, the, the, the tab tabulation was done according to the needs of the government, uh, which facilities, what is the status uh, uh, of the, so mothers, children, uh, breastfeeding status, it's holistic for the needs of nutrition. Uh, it's very malleable. Um, for the Sudan crisis, uh, for the Gaza crisis, we have a, a, another dashboard uh, on the same server with different hospitals, cases, what are the cases that are being managed, so orthopedic, uh, neuro, it's divided according to the needs of the government. Um, so it, it really highlights how DHS can be deployed for a humanitarian response. Uh, uh, and it's very malleable and easy to deploy. Um, and it, it was a, uh, an easy um, sell to the government right now why DHS is a, a good solution as part of the ecosystem within Egypt. So we have several other systems uh, up and running in the in Egypt, uh, so so we are we started the emergency uh, trackers. Uh, our technical team in the ministry are working on several other tracker or aggregate data. Uh, they're working around with it and with very minimal support from Hispmina uh, currently. But we are looking forward to a more um, robust, structured uh, support to. Uh, increase the capacity of the, a larger team of, uh, of uh, uh, people from the ministry to move forward. Uh, so what, what are the key learnings in the last few months uh, from uh, supporting DHIS? So it's a self-adoption and maybe at, at uh, this uh, podium, the, most of you are, understand what self-adoption means but for the gov uh, government who has not implemented DHIS, the, um, the mentality of we are going to buy a software from the company, the company is responsible. If they don't do it, then we end the contract. This mentality needs, uh, the shift needs a lot of work. And uh, I, I guess most of you here uh, appreciate that. Uh, the, the continuous updates and improvements, within this year we have seen uh, one update, one major update, and we, have, you know, we are fortunate that we are still not fully implementing, so we are, it's easier for us to move, but I guess the, the movement from version to version is very easy, and that's an added value that we are selling with. Uh, 
not mistaking what it's not. So when we started implementing with the hospitals, oh, we need a, uh, a digital system for x-rays and uh, different uh, MRIs. And you need to understand from the very beginning what you're selling. This is not what it is So uh, at, at the moment. So DHIS is improving on an annual basis, but you need to understand the capacities. Uh, and we really worked with the end user uh, to um, understand their needs. Um, so I, I did actually miss the first slide was wh where we came from. So we've been supporting Ministry of Health to improve the data information system from 2012. We started with an Excel form, uh, 12 indicators. We moved to 100, and then we moved to an access program. And then we integrated within the Ministry of Health's up and running system, uh, the, this dashboard and um, the, the different indicators. And when the ministry moved to a, a web-based application for aggregate data, we had the user uh, needs already uh, in place. So as a physician, I, the, the, the tool, the DHIS or any digital tool, it's about how it helps the end user, how it helps the outputs and outcomes of the country. And I guess we're all uh, focusing, should be focusing on that. It's not about the solution, it's about how it helps to improve. So our uh, way forward, we are, uh, we're looking for ongoing support from uh, HISTMINA to, to, to see where the DHIS can fit into the EcoCell system of the Egyptian uh, context. Um, we are focusing on primary healthcare services despite our emergency deployment into hospitals, but our core function is primary healthcare where we see 80% of the services should be um, provided and where automation will make a big difference. Uh, and, and we need a, a user-centric design. So we need, really need to help the front-end user um, you, uh, ease the work on himself and provide information for decision support, uh, both at the facility level or management at different ends. Uh, so this is our preliminary structure of what, what we need to do. So we have the core services within the primary health care facility, so it's uh, the annual follow-up, the clinics, the family health uh, clinics, then the well baby follow-up visits, the antenatal care services. Uh, we have something called presidential initiatives, so uh, if, if some people know we eliminated hep C, uh, we have a WHO certificate on that. Uh, over the last two years, we had a mass campaign, so these big mega campaigns are called presidential initiatives. So we have something for, on women's health, uh, on renal impairments due to the NCD crisis, which is affecting most countries. So these are the core, value, core functions within the primary health care. Uh, today when we, were talk, and when we were talking about logistics, LMS systems, so we, are, uh, we really see value in the cold chain uh, management. So we already have an EPI program up and running, web-based, ministry-owned, so we can't add vaccination currently into the DHIS because there's another system, but the interoperability between the EPI and the DHIS is something that we are looking into, the interoperability between the DHIS and the Unified Procurement Agency, which does the logistic management for procurement for all the governorates and districts, so the the uh, drugs and uh, lab items all come to the district, but managing the product within the health facility is, uh, is still a missing link. So we are looking to DHIS to be part of that link, and that was presented yesterday. Um, and of course, the interoperability with other systems in the country. Uh, we also have Rapid Pro, so Egypt is deploying Rapid Pro. Uh, since two years now, and uh, it was discussed. So it's a, a great tool for communicating with the public. So we are using it to um, send out messages, mass messaging to the population. Uh, so 
seeing how to integrate that into DHIS where you can mass message the, your clientele will be an added value. And also our work with the other national systems like the social health insurance and other major big systems within the country. So um, we're still young with DHIS, but we've done a lot over the last uh, six months. And uh, hopefully next year in Oslo, we will have uh, a lot to show with the Ministry of Health. Thank you. Okay, so. Thank you. Any questions for Motaz? Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, we have a couple. Uh, thank you, Motaz. Uh, so, based on your short, limited experience in DHIS2, what was the actual driver for you uh, to start implementing DHIS2? Was it external factors or you had planning for it? We, we were in, like I was saying, we, we are supporting digitalization since 2012. So uh, we have a program called Result Based Management. And we, in our journey, we reached the point where we need we already have aggregate data, but we need this to be available at the facility level, and we need individualized information to better manage uh, the population and to improve results. That was the driver. We start we looking for a solution to um, move to to better improve our system uh, and better improve the health outcomes. So that was the driver. DHIS is a tool that was presented, and we saw value in it that. Uh, it's easy, like we, we, I spoke about the values and the added values that we see in DHIS. And it being so malleable and uh, implemented by the government, we don't need to <coughs> always search for a new vendor, a new bidding. Uh, we, a lot of applications can actually be done like very fast. So that's, that's the added value and that's where we started from. Thank you. Thank you. My question is about the Rapid Pro. Mm. So, uh, are you integrating the Rapid Pro with the DHS2 already and using that? Uh, if if that, then uh, with which level is there only aggregate data or just case-based SMS data coming? Okay. And how do you, if there is an issue with the integration? So, Rapid Pro uh, started two years ago. So it, it it was there even before the HIS. We 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 utilized Rapid Pro as a um, a system to communicate directly with the patient and to communicate directly with the health provider. So we have a, um, the Rapid, Rapid Pro is like the, you know, the mass messaging. Mass messaging yes. Yeah, so it's, it's hosted with the Ministry of uh, Communication and it's on within Ministry of Health, but it's used by several other ministries. So we did GIS mapping of the agricultural uh, facilities with Rapid Pro, we send a message to the uh, frontliners and tell us, give us your GIS positioning. And that was done easily. We used it uh, to uh, communicate with the service provider, with the population, after the health education uh, people uh, went and gave them the messaging. So they say, this is the person I talked to. We take that message and we send to the person they went to. So yeah. it's. It's, it's quite easy, it's like... No, I know, we know, but, but my oh. question was whether you are taking data from the Rapid Pro, the DHS2 or not? No, not yet. Oh, no. So okay. they are, DHIS2 is two years old, the, uh, Rapid Pro two years old, DHIS is still starting, so we are looking into the integration right now. Uh, maybe one reflection about the uh, Egypt experience in utilizing the DHIS2. Uh, it's something uh, distinguished that uh, they focus in the preparation and design on the value-based healthcare system rather than uh, volume-based healthcare system. Dr. Mu'taz mentioned many times, if you notice, that uh, we focus on the outcome, on the impact. So uh, while we are preparing for the requirements, well, the focus was not only just to capture the data, for routine statistics and uh, program indicator. They focused to see list of patients that needed intervention for better screening. And really this is a distinguished advanced step in the design 
while you are designing for the data capture, you are focusing on the who are the risk patient that need a proper or a special uh, interventions because that's why they have what is called a presidential initiative. Presidential initiatives in Egypt focus on the volume, uh, on the value-based healthcare system, while other initiatives focus on volume. So volume versus value. So that's why we focus on the value and how to utilize uh, the DHIS2 basically what is called the working list, the patient working list to, to making that more helpful for the care provider to target a specific uh, patient in the NCD and other primary health care. And this is really uh, something uh, that comes in the early uh, stage of thinking and design. So that just I draw okay. attention to that. If I may just uh, add on the value base. So the nutrition tracker for the Sudanese uh, refugees, um, it, it, there is a auto calculation of the Z score within the nutrition tracker. And we are asking the nurses also to tell us their evaluation. So just that showed us a discrepancy in that the nurses were not able to uh, properly diagnose all the cases. They can measure properly, but they cannot diagnose. They can, the use of the growth curves, maybe because of all the pressure or the, them being in the field doing it, that in itself uh, is an added value. It showed us a gap in the training and a possibility of alleviating that point of service. They, didn't, they do not need to evaluate. They just need to uh, measure properly and the system can evaluate for them and we have better diagnosis of uh, stunted, wasted uh, children, and therefore interventions can uh, depend on an automated uh, diagnostic uh, system. So yeah, HIS has value even in uh, decision support if, if you build it properly, if you, if you, while, while you're building. Okay, so if there is nothing more, okay. thank you. Okay, so I'm going to now ask the um, Vanuatu representative to please come up uh, for her presentation. Okay, good uh, morning everyone. Um, I would like to join everyone to thank the, um, uh, Sri Lanka for hosting this conference and thank you for inviting Vanuatu to be part of this uh, conference as well. So my name is Rachel and uh, I'm managing the health information systems in Vanuatu. Uh, I'll just be, um, give a, just a brief uh, implementation um, uh, activity that has happened with DHIS2 in Vanuatu. <coughs> So just an outline of my presentation. Um, the country profile, um, Vanuatu is um, a small island nation um, made up of 83 inhabited islands. Um, most of these um, 83 um, inhabited islands are more, most remotely uh, um, islands. Uh, Vanuatu is situated uh, west of um, Sorry, in east of Australia, um, Vanuatu, we have six provinces, population of 3,000, a very small population. 80% of the population lives in the uh, most uh, rural part of uh, the country. Our growth rate is at 2.3%, um, and the life expectancy is at 71%. Um, the health system in Vanuatu, we have one national ministry of health, and then we have six provincial uh, health uh, offices, uh, for the six different provinces, and we have um, uh, the different health facilities. We have five hospitals uh, in Vanuatu. There's one main referral hospital, uh, one provincial referral hospital, and um, three provincial hospitals. And we also have 147 uh, health facilities, uh, health centers and dispensaries, and 175 eight post facilities. Just an overview of the health structure in Vanuatu. Uh, we have uh, three direct trades, as uh, stated up there. 
We have corporate services, public, public health and curative services, and um, uh, health information sits uh, directly under the corporate services of the national office. So now I'll move on to the software systems that is uh, currently used in Vanuatu. I've listed some of them here that um, we are currently utilizing. Some are still under um, uh, discussions, but these are what currently used in Vanuatu, the different software systems that are used in the Ministry of Health in Vanuatu. So we have DHIS2, um, the aggregated data, and I, ha I haven't uh, listed the DHIS2 COVID-19 tracker data as well. That's another system that we have. And then we have the core data that is uh, mainly used with, by the surveillance unit. Um, the COPO collect is another system that we use for surveys, the different um, small surveys that are currently conducted in country. And then we have the healthcare app um, that is used for NCT registry and NCT patients. And then we have the M supply, Conrad uh, 5, uh, EWAS is just implemented. And then we have the patient information system for inpatient um, inpatient systems uh, so inpatient yeah inpatient and then we have the emergency registry for outpatients we have an open eye system and a disability database so moving on to the implementation of DHIS2 according to a 2019 2021 digital health strategy uh, this is um, the plan that we have um, to integrate the different systems into the DHIS2. Um, so our, uh, we started using 2000, uh, sorry, we started using DHIS2 um, in late 2014. Um, and then uh, we started using this implementation plan in 2019 uh, after we've completed this uh, digital health strategy. And um, so, um, the plan is um, to use the, uh, the plan for this. This one is to use the DHIS2 as the reporting platform. So we have the different different uh, systems in the ministry, but then we'll use the DHIS2 as our, our reporting platform. So the current situation of DHIS2 implementation in country, uh, what we have completed so far, we have a health center dispensary, an eight post uh, module inside the DHIS2. Uh, we have a malaria aggregated data set um, and a malaria health facility supervisory in checklist inside the DHIS2 and also a malaria monthly line list. We have um, EPI aggregated data set inside the DHIS2. Uh, facility master list is also inserted into the DHIS2. Uh, our population data is also inserted into the DHIS2. And we also have a COVID-19 vaccine nation registry. What is currently done, but it's not yet completed, or not yet, sorry, it's completed, but not yet in use. We have a malaria case investigation tracker. We have a school visit, um, facility inventory form, mortality uh, details database, and a hospital aggregated data. That our plan is to complete 2023 December, and then start rolling it out 2024. Just uh, one main key achievement that we have achieved in um, this uh, DHIS2 is our COVID-19 registry. Uh, so um, uh, it uses the tracker system. Uh, it was implemented in 2021, and the main focus is to register vaccination of uh, a patient that gets vaccinated for uh, COVID-19. So the different products that um, the registry, uh, registry produces are uh, it has a um, general report that uh, provide a general report that was provided to the ministry for decision making, and then it also have um, uh, it produces an encrypted COVID-19 uh, certificate, and it also has a platform uh, that uh, the public can use for accessing their own um, uh, sorry certificates. The different challenges that we have, especially with DHIS2, um, the lack of human resources in country. Um, HIS is made up of a very small group of uh, uh, people, and also the skills that we have in country, we are, um, the officers are not really qualified to manage the DHIS too. This is something that we're currently working on. Um, the slow, well, one challenge is the slow implementation of um, uh, the system 
the DHIS tool that was started in 2018 um, due to the COVID-19 and few other factors that we have. Um, and then um, we have a lot of silo systems like you have seen there, a lot of systems in there, but they are all um, uh, silos. They're there. They're not uh, linked or connected. Um, and uh, the collection of data, uh, but no good reporting and feedback of information for decision making. Uh, and the current system requires cleaning of some elements to enhance users' access and report production, report of, uh, sorry, production of reports. So just a uh, way forward for this one, um, more of a future plan, is to complete all the tools that we have, especially the SOPs and whatever tools that we need to complete by 2023. And then as of 2024 January, we have to go live and start using all the tools uh, for two years and see how it goes with uh, what we're currently working on. Um, then complete all the trainings of uh, all the modules uh, by March of 2023 so that health workers can start it using the different tools that we're currently working on. Um, and then integrate or link all the systems that we have that I've mentioned, uh, try and integrate them or link them to FAN, HMIs, or the DHIS too. As I said, it will be the reporting um, um, system that we'll have in, in the country. Um, and then link, um, we've, we have plans also to link the um, DHIS2 to our Power BI and also our MOH website for public view of our, um, um, of our uh, the Ministry of Health information. And then to explore further the use of DHIS2 uh, Android app, we, we have it there already, but we just to explore further and then how to use it mostly in the remote part of our uh, countries because we have a lot of health facilities that are in the most remote uh, part of the country. Um, and then exploring how to uh, explore more how if we can use the COVID-19 registry as our immunization registry in country and then continue on with the maintenance of the system as required. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you, Tomas. Any questions uh, for Rachel before she escapes? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that your uh, country is spread across lots of islands, right? Are they all populated, you know, population? Mm. So 80%, 80 of the population lives on the, only 20% lives in the, uh, city or town, the small towns that uh, we have, okay. but the 80% live on the rural and the, yes, the rural okay. part of the country. Okay, so do you have any problems regarding the networking infrastructure, networking and communication infrastructure, if you want to uh, build or establish uh, one national system, information yes, of system? Course. So this is one of our, it's, it's like uh, one, one thing that the country has, we really want to start um, Rolling out, like I said, we, we, we have the Android there already, but then we, we want to continue um, exploring further how we can start using that into those 147 health facilities and 175 aid posts that are mostly in the most remote part of the country. But the network is one of our issues at the moment, and uh, we are working on it in country with the uh, providers, the network providers in country, uh, but it's still a u issue mainly into the most remote part of the country. Uh, what are the organizations that support you most? I mean, uh, 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 UN organizations or do you get support from local organizations or something? Yes, so we, we, got, uh, we got the support from a lot of UN organizations, uh, WHO, UNICEF, UNFPA, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these uh, UN agencies are in country and they're providing support especially to us for DHIS2 is true uh, the WHO is that's the main um, support that we have. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Rachel? Yes, of course. So thank you very much for the uh, nice presentation. I have one question only that you showed. You have 11 different system of reporting so what is your, your plan, a short-term plan to integrate and also to link these yes. different systems into one? So, so we have, um, these are the different systems that we have. 
it's currently silos. It's the different systems there. Um, our plan, the plan that we have, is to link them to DHIS2 as our main reporting platform. So um, DHIS2 will be, will have dashboards and all these things that will be given access to people, especially the Ministry of Health, like I said, and then. Uh, for public view, we'll, we'll have to push it out into another system, the Power BI or the uh, MOH website for people to have a view, yes. So this one, our plan is to integrate, to link them to the DHIS2. The different, the different so, um, discussions is already going and we have plans in place. regards to this so, so you have 11 systems and how you plan to sustain them because the money the funding will be ended for them anyway one day mm -hmm. so when we will what we'll do then yes yeah, so these are all the discussions that we have in country every time with all these systems and i have it with michael michael is one of our one he's been working with us in country so um most of these systems are built on um, um what do we call the systems open source, most of these ones. And they're currently, uh, for example, Codata and Copa Collect are currently with the WHO um, because those programs that are currently using it are using it for the, yes, I mean, they're working closely with WHO, those public health programs. But the other systems, we have plans in place. We have a digital health steering committee that looks after all these systems in country and making sure the sustainability of it making sure that whatever system comes in country has to be, the country will be able to sustain it. Otherwise, we don't. Uh, oh. Yes, so we are building in-country capacity, sorry. <laughs> yes, we are, we are building in-country capacity for this. We have people in country that are currently managing this, but some of them are expert, so we are, we, we have successes for these people as well in country for continuing. So, so I'll just add to that. Um, yes, yeah, sustainability is a huge issue in these small countries with very few resources um, and the capacity to maintain them. So I think, um, uh, but sometimes what happens is because it's difficult to get things up in DHIS too quickly sometimes that some of the programs go off and they develop their own systems using these ad hoc tools and um, so I think the, uh, the, the plan and the digital health strategy very much points towards using, if, if, uh, if we have a system that exists already using that system. It just doesn't always work that way. So I think, um, yeah, the strategy is really pushing towards using DHIS2 as the, as the main platform. And, and if it can't be integrated there, then at least it will become the reporting repository. But certainly not just in terms of capacity, human capacity, but even just financing these things, managing servers, managing all, all the different things you need to manage, it's, it's, it's too difficult otherwise and it's not sustainable yet. Okay, so thank you, Rachel. So I'll invite our colleague from Solomon Islands. Hello everyone. Um, first of all, before I present, continue on my with my presentation, I would like to thank the organizer to bring us to Sri Lanka. Thank you, Michael, and everyone. Um, yes, so I'm Rebecca, um, health information officer from Solomon Island. This is our presentation, Solomon Island DHIS. Again, my presentation, the outline, section one, just Solomon Island maps, uh, DHIS aggregate and DHIS two tracker instances. And section three, um, success and challenges, and section four, way forward. Uh, first of all, Solomon Islands is in the North 
east of Australia and northwest of Vanuatu. The population is about 768,619. And the landscape is 28,466 square kilometers. Uh, there are six major islands and 992 small islands, uh, atolls and reefs. We have 338 health facilities being functioning, um, not exclude, excluding sorry, the private health sectors, other health facilities, not all private health, uh, health facilities being included in this one. Uh, only 339 health facilities being reported in the district health information system. So Solomon Islands been using the HIS2 since 2012. So the country has been using the two instances that the, the HIS aggregate and tractor, trackers. In the DHIS aggregate, we able to capture um, this following, the monthly report of health activities, TB, quarterly report, syndromic, uh, surveillance, uh, which we, yeah. And the <laughs> malaria case management register, bad notification, um, and now we are used, uh, trying to implement COVID-19 surveillance aggregate. Um, this year, we managed to use the uh, aggregate version 2.36. Um, and then next, the tracker capture instances, we use it to capture COVID-19 vaccination, COVID-19 case um, based civilians, which will be introduced this year as well. We'll try our best. And then the mortality data being entered into the DHIS as well. That includes dead notification, bad medical debt, medical certification of cause of deaths. Um, so the dead notification being used in the rural health facility, all the nurses um, fill in the forms. Uh, for the medical certificate of cause of death is being filled in the um, hospitals. So that's the two different forms. All these forms are sent to the provincial headquarters. They are entered in the provincial health quarters in the provinces. So section four, success and challenges. The success for this year, uh, during the period from since, since 2012 to now, um, DHIS to upgrade training, we have done DHIS2 upgrade training for version 2.36 because of the features will be changed. So we train our staffs. Um, HIS staff nationally and provincial and also malaria mo monitoring and evaluation data entry offices. Uh, and also the success we have since last year, we enter mortality data into tracker capture. And also um, this year we have managed to made consultation with uh, meetings with the health, public health programs. Uh, not all public health programs join DHIS and now our goal is to uh, bring them into DHIS too. And also one of the most important one we have worked, we work together with University of Oslo, uh, his Vietnam and Lao. And now I have all of you, which is one of the most successful one too. Once we have issue, I can contact you guys, contact all of you to help us. And uh, challenges, we have challenge with the DHI upgrade time frame. We plan to do this last year, but due to the time frame, we were unable to do that. So this year we did it. And then managing of the saver, we don't have capacity to do it in our country because we have small groups. 
and yeah, lack of staff with capacity, delay of reporting due to a, ge a geographical um, status in the country, and financial support from, from the government. Most of us, most of the activities that we did in the country uh, was sponsored by the donors. So we are trying our best uh, for the government to recognize uh, the head, uh, our unit in Solomon. And so these are a few of the photos. So you can see the challenges that we have. We have Aniraj and Dilly from WHO. They came over, I think last month, to train us. And also having the consultation meeting with the health programs in the country. And our success, we, yeah, this is uh, one of the pictures that Dilip and Niraj came over and then we have uh, consultation meetings with the other health programs that are not included in the DHIS yet. And here's um, two trainings that we've done this year for the um, DHIS2 upgrade training. I Sorry, I don't have the photos in there. This is for the DHIS to surveillance training, which I would like to, to thank Michael, uh, Lao team, uh, Sam, and Yama, and Nick as well. So thank you so much for your help. Okay, way forward, section five, way forward, uh, we'll be planning to integrate all the public health programs. Um, also, the HIS2 Android app for malaria programs, oh, deaths and births, HIS staff capacity building, restructuring um, roles and responsibilities for all the national HIS staff. Um, sorry, we have like seven staffs three data entries and I think four HIS officers. Um, and then recruiting of dedicated HIS staff. So that's all from me, thank you. This is one of the largest uh, lagoon in Solomon Islands. Once you come over, this is part of the western part of the Solomon Island. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for Rebecca? Okay. Seems not. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah. So we've actually ended a bit, uh, about 10 minutes early. We don't have any other presentations at this time. So just going to give you the extra time. We'll start our lunch at 12.30, uh, similarly. But maybe I can just go over some logistics um, for the rem remainder of the day. So um, we will have a couple parallel sessions after the lunch break, um, including um, one for MAPS, as well as one on nutrition and cause of death. So the MAPS session will be here in this room, and then nutrition and cause of death will be in the Gregory room. Okay, so sim similar setup for the parallel sessions. We'll start with those directly after lunch. Okay, after those sessions are done, we'll come back for the closing. So everyone will be in this room for the last session of the day after the final tea break, okay? So please come back to this room and we'll, we'll close. And, and I know some of you have plans to get outside, so we'll try not to keep you here um, too late in the day, all right? Um, so yeah, you can take a 10 minute break and then we'll have our lunch and we'll continue again at 1.30. Thank you very much.